Okay, folks, good afternoon. Uh, a few announcements. One is about the homework assignment. Uh, basically, what I want you guys to do for this homework assignment is the simulation file. Most of it is almost, almost most of it is already attached to the, the, to the homework assignment on Blackboard. All I want you to do is to close the loop, meaning that you measure the output voltage, maybe you have a sensing network, and slip it down if you want to, compare it with the reference, apply the error to a compensation network, and then beyond that you need to have some sort of a PWM a modulation scheme to convert the level of your signal to the duty cycle. And then replace it, basically apply it over here. So ultimately this has to be removed, and then you have to close the loop from here to here. Uh, so the only challenge is to design your voltage composition network in the sense that um, it requires the, for instance, you would like to eliminate the steady state error, therefore the gain at low frequency or DC frequency is very high, like 1 over S appears in your transfer function. Then you would like to attenuate the 120 hertz ripple in the output voltage, so you need to have attenuation there as well. And then ultimately you want to eliminate or attenuate the switching frequency repole, which is 100 kilohertz or whatever it is. Actually, it should be 100 kilohertz. I think that that's, that's required. Uh, so that's about the homework assignment. And you, all you need to do is just email me your simulation file. And then I'll run it and see what the performance of your system is. If you're interested in you know, writing down your observations or anything like that, it's not mandatory. But if you would like to, you can also email that one to me as well in one email. Please make sure everything is in one email. Uh, the other announcement or reminder is about how I am going to be evaluating your, uh, your basically, your, how am I going to come up with your overall grade? Uh, so let's go to Blackboard here. So everything that you need to know is already there. It has been there since the beginning of the semester <coughs> under syllabus. OK, so. So if you are a. <coughs> If you are an on-campus student, 47.5% of your homework assignments, and then another 47.5% for your quizzes, that gives me 95, and then 5% for your attendance. And then if you are an off-campus student, then 50% homework assignment, and then 50% quizzes. Now, the way it works is if you get 90 and above, you are an A. If you get 80 to 90, you are a B, and so on and so forth. So please make sure. I've actually already put it there. Even if you are 89.99, you are pretty much not an A. Now, when it comes to quizzes, we have had a total of six quizzes. And... Um, if you wish to take the final exam... Uh, so I will actually replace it with the two lowest quizzes that you have had. For instance, you were absent, or you didn't do well in one of the quizzes, or maybe two of the quizzes. You can choose to take the final exam to replace those two scores. Attendance, uh, if you have missed four classes, no problem. That's normal. And uh, if you have actually missed five classes and above, then I'm going to actually start subtracting from that 5% of credit that you are going to have. So please don't email me what my grade is. All I can do is I can, my obligation is to make sure by next week on Thursday, you have all the scores for your quizzes and all the scores for your homework assignments and all the scores uh, and the, your attendance score. And then beyond that, please calculate it yourself. Do not ask me if you are getting an A or B or do not ask me Oh, I did a math at home. My score is an 89.7. Can I get an A and not take the final? Uh, the answer is no. If you want, you have to take the final. All right, any questions? Yes. So uh, after knowing what, where we stand. OK. But I, let's say I still want to take the exam. OK. But I just want to, uh, for the, for the uh, 
Okay, I understand. So the exam doesn't have a negative influence. So even if you choose to come here and take the exam and just you know, get zero in the exam, it doesn't have an, in a positive way it helps you. In a negative way it doesn't help you. It doesn't actually hurt you. It doesn't hurt you. <coughs> so uh, we may still go with the two lowest graded quizzes. That's what you're trying yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah. So for instance, you have a quiz that is eight and another one is seven and your final exam is six. So it doesn't hurt. You know, I just look at the lowest ones. Yes, that's right. Um, any qu other questions? Yes. Uh, the other day you mentioned that there will be lesser topic for the final exam. And yes, and I have to announce that. Uh, so your, your final exam is like equivalent to two quizzes, obviously. I mean, there are only going to be two problems. And I'm going to send you a list of topics, hopefully next week. Uh, usually the topics that is easier to design a question from, okay? If it is a simulation-based kind of a thing, obviously that's not a good fit for a final exam. But I will, I will announce that uh, next week. So the, the final only make out the quiz. What about the homework? If you have a really low homework? It doesn't do the homework assignment. The reason that I only do it for the quiz is um, you may get sick at the very same time that you have the quiz, so you may miss a quiz, or you may not be a good exam taker, and therefore your scores might be a little low. Uh, but homework assignments, you have a week or two weeks to work on, and then even if you are not here, you can still ask a friend to submit it, or you can you know, email it to me. So for the homework assignments, I'm not going to do any replacement, only for the quizzes. Um, other, so. The stress part comes with the exam part, which is in the quizzes. The homework assignments, I'm assuming, they are not as stressful. Um, other questions? OK. So we are going to continue our lecture on um, soft switching techniques. So we kind of started, why is it that we need soft switching, basically? One of the motivations is to protect our switches. Like, if you are using an SCR, especially an SCR, uh, which is a, it's like a, a thyrostor or a silicon controlled uh, rectifier, um, SCRs are very prone to large variations in the, in like a very high rate of voltage or very high rate of current variations. For instance, they may falsely trigger to be on if dV over, over, over dt is too high or if di over dt is too high for any kind of switch, not just SCRs, you may have the, p the current is not going to be evenly distributed in, your, in the semiconductor device, in the silicon. It goes through a particular path, and that path may get too hot and burn out, basically. So you're actually damaging your switch. So we looked at, for instance, this simple buck topology. When you turn the switch off, in an ideal case, you have a very, very large stress as in terms of dV over uh, dt. If you look at the current situation, it is almost the same thing when you are turning the switch on or off. So let's take a look at the current one now. So what we prefer to see is something like this. And by the way, I'm assuming that my switches are ideal. Therefore, the switching transition is almost nothing or zero. But in practice, it takes a little bit of a time. Uh, so we prefer it to be like this. So we prefer it to be like when the switch is on, obviously, ideal switch, no voltage drop. And then when we turn it off, it gradually rises to the off stage, basically. So the voltage should ideally gradually rise. Uh, so we are looking at a dV over dt that is limited. OK, something like this. OK, so for current, almost the same stuff. Let's take a look. Uh, 
for instance, I draw, draw the current waveforms over here. So we're looking at the current of the switch. Yeah, it's already it's already there in this in the circuit diagram. So for instance, when you turn the switch on this time, switch is off, no current, and then on it jumps to the IL at that particular point. Okay, and therefore DI over DT is too much. Okay, and this is not good. And what we prefer to see is <coughs> we prefer to see something like this. So when we turn the switch on, for instance, the current doesn't jump to the IL value, it gradually rises to IL value. So a limited slope. Or when you look at DI over DT, We have something like this, okay? Um, so, um, so we know what we want. The question is, how can we achieve what we want? And usually, when you are talking about bring some sluggishness in the voltage or bring some sluggishness in the current, we are technically talking about adding capacitors and inductors, extra capacitors and extra capac and inductors to the network. So, if you want to add, if you happen to add a capacitor okay in parallel with the switch okay you can technically uh, limit <coughs> dv over dt Remember, capacitors by nature, they resist changes in their voltage. So dV over dt for a capacitor is always limited. And now this capacitor is placed with your switch, in parallel with your switch. Therefore, you can actually get, uh, get to the point that you want to get. Also, so this is the solution. Or when you're talking about the current, if you add an inductor in series, Uh, with the switch, so inductors have limited DIs over DT, and this particular inductor is placed in series with my switch. Therefore, my switch has a limited DI over DT. But as it turns out, it is not as easy as just adding these components in parallel or in series with the switch. We solve a problem at some point, and then we are adding more problems somewhere else. So let's take a look at that. Let's, for instance, uh, go after the solution of adding a capacitor in parallel with our uh, switch in the Bach topology. So let's take a look at this. So here is my switch, and we've caught, because I'm trying to limit dV over dt, I'm adding a capacitor in parallel, and then the rest. Okay. And remember, a lot of time, we care about dV over dt during the turn-off period, not the turn-on period. Because in the turn-on period, the switch is on, so we don't have to worry about false triggering and being turned on in a, in a false way. So um, 
So remember, everything, is, everything else is ideal. So let's take a look at transition. from on to off. For the switch. Okay. So, um, so we're looking at a case that before switch was on, then there's some transition now because of the capacitor, and then the switch is off. So let's take a look at these three modes. So initially, the switch is on, and therefore, the capacitor is shorted. There's nothing wrong with that. Switch is on. We have a short circuit path over there, and the entire current passes through this uh, switch, and Vs is 0. So no problem here. So I'm just going to draw the rest of the circuit like this. Okay. So we have switches on, diode is off. And everything looks normal. And now we turn the switch on. I'm sorry, we turn the switch off. But because we have this capacitor there, the voltage doesn't see actually does does not actually start conduction immediately. So first that is gonna first thing that is gonna happen is this capacitor is gonna gradually get I mean charged to a sense that so we already have continuous conduction current. So this current is flowing here and therefore the conduction path is like this. Okay, so this current is kind of charging the capacitor. And if you look at this voltage from here to here, this is Vn minus Vc, assuming that this is the polarity for Vc. So at the very beginning of this mode, remember, capacitor voltage is continuous. At the very beginning of this mode, the switch was on. It just turned off. Therefore, capacitor voltage is zero. So the diode sees a voltage of basically Vn. Then Vc starts, you know, um, starts getting charged. So Vc grows. So Vn minus Vc starts getting smaller and smaller, to a point that it hits zero and wants to get negative. But because there is a diode there, the diode does not allow it to get negative. So at that point, the diode is going to turn on. And that is basically our last mode. So we go from here to here, and then from here to here. So this gets to uh, V, basically, this gets to Vn. And now the diode is on. So the, the mode on the left is normal. Switch is on, diode is off. The mode on the right is normal. Switch is off, diode is on. But we have like a transition mode that we have added because of this capacitor. And that is when both of the devices are off. So it's an extra mode. Depending on the value that we have chosen for the capacitor, uh, this capacitor is not a very large capacitor. It's relatively a small. So this mode is relatively a small. And it's just a transitional mode. Um, one thing that I should highlight here is as I said, the, the, this kind of soft switching capacitors and inductors that we add, in addition to the regular capacitors and inductors that we need, they are really relatively small in size. 
And a lot of times, this transition happens very quickly. And because of that, you assume that your current over here doesn't change much during that transition. Or in other words, your inductor here is much larger than this C. I call it CS, the capacitor that is parallel with the switch. So it's CS. So, um, so as the assumption is the inductor is much larger than CS, meaning that the inductor and this CS do not have a chance to resonate with each other. Inductor is very large. Therefore, the inductor is almost like a source of current in this transition mode. Like a constant source of current, OK? So when you're trying to analyze the circuit, you shouldn't say, well, ideally, you should say I have two capacitors and one inductor. Therefore, it's a third order system. I have to you know, write the differential equations. or you can make the assumption that, OK, inductor is much larger than CS. Therefore, all that is happening is, is as if CS is being charged by a constant source of electric current, which is the inductor current, basically, something like that. So now, if you actually look at this transition, Initially, the switch was on, so no voltage, ideal switch. Then we have a cap that is being charged by a constant source of current. Therefore, the voltage of this cap is linearly, almost linearly rising. And then when we get to the last mode, that the switch is off and the cap is already charged to V in, so it just gets flat. And there's a transition, basically. OK. And we can actually determine the duration of this transition, or actually the slope of the voltage, by actually finding the right size for this CS as well as having enough information about the operating conditions that what, what, what is the amount of current that is passing through the switch right before we turn it off. Is it 10 amps, or is it 10, 100 amps, or is it 1,000 amps? And that and the value that we choose for the, for the cap actually determines this slope, which is dV over dt, which is what we are intending to actually limit, basically. So obviously, a larger capacitor would give you a lower dV over dt, which is better. But as it turns out, well, we kind of achieved what we were trying to do from one perspective. And that was um, make sure when we turn the switch off, the voltage of the switch does not suddenly jump to Vn. It gradually rises to Vn. So that perspective, from that perspective, you're doing good. However, we are adding more problems to the system. So let's look at some of these problems. OK. The first problem is, think about when we turn the switch on after whatever this mode is here. After a little while, we have to, our, our, our period is like in one, in the majority of the, you know, like, like, let's say like 30% of the time the switch is on, 70% of the time the switch is off. So we are staying in this mode for a little while, but then we have to transition to an on state for the switch. In that case, when you turn the switch on, you have a capacitor in parallel with the switch. So any amount of charge that was stored in this capacitor is all of a sudden shorted, OK? So uh, and being lost, basically. So the cap will be Now, 
discharged when switch <coughs> is turned on so we fixed the turn off procedure but we added problems to the turn on procedure not now that as soon as the switch is turned on there's also capacitor that is already precharged to a certain voltage therefore certain amount of energy is stored in this capacitor and we just short it so we have an impulse of current there uh, so let's talk about the energy losses. So Every time that we turn the switch on, what, how much energy did we have in the cab? 1 over C times Vn squared, because cab was charged to Vn, and that amount of energy is being lost, basically. <coughs> in the switch, actually, not somewhere else, in the switch. <coughs> and so again, let me also highlight that. So this energy is lost in the switch, or dissipated in the switch. Okay, so now our switch is going to get warmer and warmer. Then we have to worry about adding a heat sink to the switch and you know things like that. Okay, so we solved the problem. At some point, then we added another problem somewhere else. Now um, the question is, can we at least do something about this network so that our energy is not lost? in the switch. It is lost somewhere else, okay? So that we don't have to worry about the heat sink for the switch and cooling of the switch and things like that. So let's take a look at that solution. Okay? So improved solution, uh, technically you can't really get rid of these losses. All you can do is just move it from the switch to somewhere else. So energy better be dissipated outside the switch. Okay, so whenever we want to lose energy, what do we do? We add a resistor, okay? So let's try that. So I already have this cap. I add an extra resistor over here and then put the whole thing in parallel with the switch. Okay, something like this. So this way you can argue that when we turn the switch on, we are not instantly shorting the capacitor. We are actually forming an RC network, and that RC network capacitor is gradually going to get discharged through the resistor, and some of the energy is going to be dissipated in the in the resistor, and obviously there is some energy in the internal resistance, uh, resistance of the switch as well. So at least part of the energy stored in the capacitor uh, will be dissipated. in um, in R 
not in the switch. Okay, so we are kind of shifting those losses, part at least part of the losses, to outside of the switch, so we don't have to worry about our switch getting too hot. Then add a large, you know, uh, heating to it and make sure that it is it is reliably functioning well. All right, so we solve this problem. However, there is another problem coming up, and that problem is, so when we, remember, what, why did we add this capacitor in the, in the first place? We added the capacitor so that um, uh, when we turn the switch off, this capacitor, the current of the inductor passes through this capacitor and then gradually actually rises. Now, we have an RC network, so basically what happens is is now if you look at the voltage of the switch during the turn off procedure, let's say switch was on ideal switch, no voltage drop, then when we turn it off we have a capacitor and a resistor placed in series with an inductor. So we have actually a little bit of an exponential kind of a behavior. It's not necessarily bad, but the problem is we have an RC kind of a network there, so it actually may take some long, so longer transition. Okay, and remember, we want this transition to be relatively short, but we add a, a resistor there, and it's going to get a little bit more sluggish. So we added the, the resistor because during the turn-on procedure, we wanted to have a resistor to dissipate that energy stored in the cap in the resistor rather than in the switch. But then we add another problem during the turn-on procedure. Now, there's a solution for that, and that is make this resistor so we want the resistor in one way, and we don't want the resistor the other way. So we can make this resistor a unidirectional resistor by adding a diode in parallel with the resistor. So solution would be Something like this. Okay. So what's going on here is when we close the switch, what happens is um, the capacitor charge goes through the switch, goes through the resistor, and goes over here. So this is when switch is turned on. Okay, so when the switch is turned on, the energy stored in this um, uh, a snubber capacitor is kind of dissipated in the resistor. When the switch is turned off, what happens is the current of the inductor pushes this capacitor to charge and pushes this diode to turn on, and then it goes here for that transition port, uh, part. So during the turn-off procedure, uh, we don't have this resistor. During the turn-on procedure, we actually have the resistor. Okay. So this is called a polarized voltage snubber.
Okay, and because we are using one resistor, one capacitor, and one diode in it, it is sometimes also called RCD snubber. Okay, so we added all of these components to make our switch happy in terms of limiting dV over dt when we turn the switch off. Now, if you're concerned about the diode, you've got to add the same elements in parallel with the diode as well, the voltage of the diode. And I'm not going to cover it, but something similar to discussion could be applied when you care about the inductor. Uh, you care about di over dt. Therefore, you've got to add some inductors in series with your switch. But generally, um, Inductors are not preferred because of their bulkiness, and usually when you add the snubbers to a network, it is a capacitor-based snubber to limit dV over dt. It's not an inductor-based snubber to limit di over dt. Okay. So um, this is snubber that we have, we are still actually adding losses to the network, okay? So it's actually a dissipative snubber. Okay, so the question is, can we achieve the same goal without adding this resistor and technically have a non-dissipative snubber? So that is one motivation for us, to, to look into zero voltage switching or zero current switching schemes. Uh, any questions so far? How do we design R and C values? Okay. The capacitor value is determined on how much transition time you want, or how much a slope you want, basically. So you look at your VIN and see, OK, VIN is 100 volts. And if I, you know, if I keep this transition at one, let's say, microsecond, how much is dV over dt? And is my switch, look at the data, switch, data sheet of the switch, is my switch OK with this dV over dt? If it is OK, then you can actually, OK, just find a, what basically, uh, let me see. So you're looking at delta Q is C delta V, right? Delta V is like, for instance, from 0 to Vn, OK, and delta Q is the amount of inductor current times um, this transition time. I call it delta t. OK? So you have kind of this relationship, and then you can find what the value of your capacitor should be, something like that. The value of the resistor, uh, again, if the, re if the resistor is too large, it is going to take forever for this RC network to do what it is supposed to be doing. So you want to actually limit the resistor to a, to a certain, like you have, you're looking at a couple of time constants should be still as smaller than your switching frequency or the switching period. So that's, that's how you can actually approach the value of the resistor. Um, I mean, numerically, you have to kind of simulate it or look at the equations to see. There is not a magic number for the R and C. It's just a matter of what kind of uh, limitations you have in terms of your data sheet information on the switch and how much current is passing through the inductor at the time of the turn off. Uh, any other questions? Uh, so the question is, can we manipulate the digital, the controller part to avoid this turn on or turn off transitions? The answer is no, or if there is something I am not aware of, all you can do is instead of instantly applying a pulse, okay, so one manipulation could be if this is the gate of my transistor, what we do is Gate voltage is, for instance, 
high or 10 volts or whatever that means the switch is on then all of a sudden we bring it down to zero so switch was on here then the switch is off something like that all we can do is instead of this fast transition bring it like this for instance gradually bring it down so that means you're gradually by the control that you're applying to your switch you're gradually transitioning from on to off now you may achieve the goal but at the same time because your switch is going to take a long time to go from on to off and it is a still conducting current you're adding a lot of losses to your switch so yes you achieve limiting dv over dt or di over dt but you're adding huge amount of current or huge amount of losses in your switch because then the current waveform and the voltage waveform of the switch are overlapping with each other that's the only thing that I can think of other than that honestly I can't think of anything uh, that can achieve this goal uh, other questions we had okay absolutely uh, so the switching frequency is determining this period okay so you want this transition to be much smaller than your period so this transition should not be 30 percent of the period because then v out over v in is d is not valid anymore because we are spending a lot of time during this on this transition so yes the switching period or the switching frequency has a direct influence on how you time out these transition times Mm -hmm. So there is no capacitor over there. Okay. So if it is uh, off, okay. the capacitor charge is full. Right. So it, when it is switched on again, mm -hmm. it is supposed to discharge fully before it gets off again. Oh, okay. I got what you mean. So that's what I said. The, the energy losses per switch turn on is this much. So the per second would be you add the switching frequency here as well. Right? So if you are turning on and off your switch 100,000 times every second, you're losing a little bit of energy each time times your frequency is that the whole amount of energy that you're losing. So the higher the switching frequency, the higher the losses are going to be. Absolutely. Is that what your question is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Because if the switching frequency is too high, mm -hmm. then the capacitor doesn't get enough time to discharge itself. Okay. So okay. Good point. Ideally, you're assuming that the internal resistance of the switch is so little, so as soon as you turn your switch on, the capacitor is totally discharged. You're right, but you're right. So technically, in a non-ideal way, uh, in a non-ideal way, it is, it is going to take a little bit of time for the capacitor to be totally discharged. But that time is usually small. It's probably in the order of nanoseconds or something. It, it, that is determined by the internal resistance of the cap and the internal resistance of your switch. But that time is relatively short, so we would not worry about it. We are also putting resistors in series with the capacitor. Okay. We, we added a resistor in series with the capacitor? Yeah. Okay, now remember this resistor um, is only in effect when you are trying to um, uh, you are turning turn on the switch okay so yeah we are actually prolonging that transition time you're right so now that we are adding a resistor to the switch now we are looking at kind of an RC network and this RC in terms of time constant so that, let me actually add it over here, here as well so uh, let me call this CS RS so remember CS times RS, which is the time constant, should be much, much smaller than 1 over the switching frequency. Okay. Like maybe, I don't know, C t CS times RS should be maybe less than 2% or 5% of the switching period, not 40%. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, okay, so L, the value of the main inductor in the topology is determined by you want to be in the continuous conduction mode or not, 
and then how much ripple are you going to observe in the output and things like that. So L is determined by those very early design equations that we had, like L should be larger than, I don't know, D times R over F or something like that. So L is determined by that. That's the main component of your power stage. Then C is determined so that C is smaller than L. And it is usually that's the case. I mean, it's usually like L is in the micro, C is in the nano, for instance, range. OK? Um, other questions? OK. So this was a, this is a very common and simple approach. A lot of times when you look at a, for instance, design of an industry kind of a design of a power converter, not a, like a laboratory student design here, you've seen it in, in parallel with your switches, you have resistors and capacitors. And that's b exactly because of this. Or even in parallel with your diodes, you have uh, resistors and capacitors, so they are kind of basically trying to limit dV over dt, OK? Or those you know, various spikes of ringing effects and things like that. So they are trying to uh, slow the transition down a little bit. At the same time, they are adding losses to the system, OK? All right, so, so this was all about one of the motivations. So the first motivation that I actually highlighted up here was to limit dV over dt or di over dt to protect our switch. Now motivation two is losses in the system or switching losses. Okay, transient um, or switching losses actually, transient switching losses or just switching losses. Okay. So, so far we have always assumed that our switches are ideal, meaning that as soon as I want a switch to be on, it is on. As soon as I want it to be off, it is off. Now, practically, that is not the case. So, in this case or here, uh, the switching transient is not assumed to be instantaneous. Okay, so meaning that when we command the switch to turn on, it takes a while for the switch to turn on, basically. Plus, I think we talked about this at the very beginning of this class. We are also going to consider that our diodes have reverse recovery time. Okay, and we are going to talk about what, what it is. So let's consider, again, our Bach topology, simplest topology ever. And then uh, let's consider that we have a MOSFET now. Re realizing the switch. And we also have this diode over there. And then the rest of the system. Okay, so we are monitoring uh, the current of this switch, the voltage of the switch, uh, the current of this diode, as well as the voltage of the diode. Okay, and let's say we are focusing on uh, this switch is transitioning from off 
to on In other words, the diode is transitioning from on to off. Or maybe, let me write it down. Diode transi switch transitions from on to off. All right. So uh, we are going to look at some practical. So technically, if you buy a real MOSFET and buy a real diode and add a bunch of measurement devices to this, to the network, this, this, the waveforms that you are going to observe are like this. So first the switch was off. We are assuming that it, it is off. Now we are t it's, turn it's being turned on. So switch is off. No current passing through the switch. Then we, we actually, when we command it to turn on, it kind of almost linearly ramps up and goes to a peak, then kind of recovers back to, to on, basically. OK, something like this. So this level that it recovers back to is IL. Again, this transition is still relatively small compared to the switching period, meaning that IL is almost constant here. It's not, we don't really show the ramp in IL at all. And this peak also has a name. It is called IRM. So if you look at a data sheet of a MOSFET, you might actually see the number IRM under a particular test condition. Uh, so remember, I, according to KCL, for any, any buck topology, the current of the switch plus the current of the diode is IL. OK, so now I can actually draw IL. ID, I'm sorry. Before switch was on, off, diode was on, diode was conducting IL. But now, this is like ramping down, goes to some negative territories. and then recovers. OK, something like this. And actually, I, I was mistaking a little bit earlier. IRM comes from your diode, actually, data sheet. OK. So what happens to the diode is, as the diode is turning off, the current of the diode gradually comes down to 0. Okay, But it doesn't stay at 0. It actually goes to negative territories for a little bit and then recovers back to 0. Okay, So this, this is the reverse recovery thing that we were talking about. Okay. And if you look at the voltage drop on your switch, OK, the voltage drop on the switch is going to be almost V in until you are, you are almost getting to that peak for the, for the switch current. And then it recovers down to 0.
Okay. And the voltage of the diode is, now remember again, the voltage of the diode, um, the voltage of the switch minus KVL, voltage of the switch minus voltage of the diode is the input voltage. So I can actually draw a VD as well. It's zero when the diode was on, then it gradually goes down over here. Okay, uh, so if you look at <coughs> exactly what's going on, I can actually divide this into several segments uh, region one, region two, region three. Region four and then region five. So in region one, switch is off, diode is on. In region two, switch is turning on. <coughs> diode is uh, turning off voltage of the switch is still Vn even though it is turning off and the voltage of the diode is almost zero okay uh, in region 3 switch is turning on And uh, diode is turning off. Off. Okay. And uh, in region three, the highlight of region three is that the current of the diode is negative. Not only that, the slope of the current is also negative. That means it's getting even more negative in in region three. Vs is almost Vn still, and Vd is almost zero. Okay. Region four. <coughs> Switch is turning on. Diode is turning off. Uh, so the, indi the diode current is negative, but things are getting better. The, the slope is positive. That means it is returning back to zero. It's not getting more and more negative. And finally, region five, the transition is over, switch is on, and then diode is off. So if you remember earlier in this class, we kind of introduced this reverse recovery phenomenon and it was because of the existence of the minority carriers. Minority carriers are where they are not supposed to be, and then gradually they have to drift and diffuse, and a new balance should be restored. So if you really, first of all, I want to highlight that this transition is very quick. It's still very quick, like in the order of like nanoseconds. It's not even milliseconds. So maybe the, to the whole thing is going to last maybe 20, 30 nanoseconds. It's a very, very short, uh, short transition. Uh, however, if you look at the, for instance, if you focus on the, for instance, the switch, you look at, you look, you, you realize that in this short transition, there is a little bit of an overlap between the voltage of the switch and the current of the switch. And ideally, in the switch current and voltage should not ever overlap. Otherwise, you are going to be having losses in your switch. So, if you look at, actually power or instantaneous value of the power that is lost in your switch. OK. <coughs> so all I have to do is just multiply IS by VS. 
So in region 1, like IS is 0 because the switch is off, so power is 0. But in region 2, 3, and 4, um, IS and VS are non-zero. So once I multiply them by each other, I get something like, like this. Mm. OK. Okay, something like almost an approximation. So you can see that technically every time that I turn my switch on, because of this little bit, little you know, overlap between the inductor, the switch current, and the switch voltage, I'm losing a little bit of energy. And then if you focus on the other side, when you turn your switch off, you are going to lose a little bit of energy there, and these are called the switching losses. For the diode, almost the same story. instantaneous value of the losses in the diode. It happens in region 4, actually. It is something like this. OK? I would also like to note that these are all approximations. If you look at a particular data sheet, you may see data that is a little bit different than this. So it depends on the structure of the switch, what kind of material is used, what were the test conditions, what was the voltage of the converter, what was the current of the converter, those kind of things. But roughly speaking, like what I mean by approximation is, roughly speaking, I'm assuming that this is a straight line. It may not exactly be a straight line, OK? I mean, it depends on what kind, of, what kind of structure you have in your switch. Um, so this equation is also uh, an approximation. So if you look at turn on losses, It is almost equal to the duration of the second phase plus the duration of the third phase times the inductor current plus this peak value of the reverse recovery current times the input voltage. Again, it is an approximation. You may open up another paper, another thesis. You may actually find another equation. And this only looks at the turn on losses. Then for turn off, there is another equation. So you have to add them together. That would be one, one switching loss. And then multiplied by your frequency, it would be your total power losses in your switch in terms of switching. Remember, your switch already has its conduction losses anyway. So it's just, it's just a switching loss part of it. So, um, so does the manufacturer provide T2 and T3 for us? Does the diode manufacturer provide I, uh, reverse recovery, peak reverse recovery current to us? Usually they do. The, the, the reverse part is usually determined. But T2 and T3 may not be provided to you. Sometimes the manufacturer just tells you a number that is the turn on losses is, is this much, like, I don't know, millijoules or microjoules or something like that, given a certain test condition. So it's, instead of giving you these, these quantities, they gives you the whole thing, basically. Under a particular test condition, that was the measured losses for your switch. So you have to scale it up and down. If your, for instance, voltage in your converter is different than their test condition, or if your current is different than their test condition, you have to scale it up and down a little bit. Oops. All right, any questions? All right. So now you can see that technically, because there is a bit of an overlap between the switch voltage and the switch current, or the diode voltage and the diode current, we are, ex we are actually observing some losses in the system. But the argument is, if you make these transitions smoother, your losses are going to be a little bit smaller, basically. So let's take a look at that. So if I draw the voltage of the switch versus the current of the switch, It is something like this. Okay. 
So at this point, voltage is V in, current is zero, or the switch is off. At this point, voltage is zero, current is either IL, therefore the switch is on. So it follows some, some approximated trajectory like this. And because voltage times current is power, your turn on losses is basically proportional with this area. Okay? So the question is, can we reduce this surface? In other words, if we manipulate the system in a way that my, my switch, as I turn it off, the current of the switch does not instantly, or as soon as possible, does not have to reach IL and takes a little bit of a time, uh, it would be better. In other words, if I, for instance, change this slope to this, then the overlap between the voltage and current is going to be minimized, therefore my losses is going to be a little bit less, basically. So that is the motive. Another second motivation to provide a ZVS. Okay? So if you manipulate the system in a sense that during this switching transition, your voltage remains close to zero, or your current remains close to zero, or they both remain close to zero, then you can argue that you can, you are reducing the surface, therefore your losses is going to be less. So let me just plot it over here. And we haven't still talked about how, but if you manage to provide zero voltage switching, meaning that your switch voltage is hovering around zero before and after the turn, off turn on procedure, you can argue that you will achieve something like this. Okay, so your surface area has been reduced, therefore your turn on energy loss is actually reduced. Okay, or if you argue that you can provide some zero current switching during the turn on procedure, It is going to look like this. So again, the argument is during the switching transition, oops, this is not IL. <coughs> during the switching transition, the switch current is almost zero. The, the switch has no rush to rise its current to, for instance, the level of IL. After that, it is going to do it anyway. But during the transition, it doesn't, it doesn't care much. And uh, then you may actually be able to achieve both. Which is more difficult, but it is possible. So both the voltage of the switch and the current of the switch are in the proximity of zero when the, tr the transition happens. Okay. Now, um, this was all focusing on the turn on procedure for the switch. You can almost make a similar argument for the turn off procedure of the switch. And by the way, if you provide ZVS or zero voltage switching or ZCS, zero current switching, for the turn on procedure, 
that does not guarantee that they also exist for the turn off procedure, okay? So sometimes you realize in its particular topology, when you turn your switch on, it is ZVS, but when you are turning it off, it is ZCS. So just, just remember, if you have one of them, it doesn't necessarily mean you all have, uh, like if you have ZVS for turn on, it doesn't guarantee that you have ZVS for turn off as well, and vice versa. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight is, these are all ideal things. Practically, we cannot do that. Let me show you the practical one, just for one of them. Okay, practically, you can actually manipulate the by adding a bunch of components, and we are going to talk about it like next week, uh, to you know limit the voltage of the switch as you are turning it off. Uh, but what happens is your current is going to be more during that transition. Because most of the times when you are, we, we want to do ZVS or ZCS, we add Ls and Cs or resonant comp com components to the system. They resonate with each other. One of them is at the proximity of zero. The other one, because it's resonating, it actually peaks to a certain number. So the current stress on the switch, even though the voltage is around zero, the current stress is more than IL. So you're fixing the problem on the voltage side. You're adding more problems on the current side. And the question is, is this a good compromise or not? All right, so this was all about motivation two, which is to minimize or eliminate uh, the switching losses when you turn the switch. Or Again, this is ju I just talked about the switch. You can make the exact argument for the diodes as well, OK? And there is a third motivation. Okay, and that is the, the EMI noise, basically, the radiation. Like, if you have a very high dV over dt, um, and, um, or we have a very high di over dt, it is going to basically link with some of the parasitic components in your like, system. Like, if you have a parasitic inductor or a parasitic capacitor, they start actually acting up, and like, your parasitic inductor starts acting like an antenna and radiating electromagnetic noise to the rest of the system, or, you know, something like that. So sometimes you go after um, reducing ZVS and ZCS if you're using this converter in an environment that it should have a very limited you know, noise, EMI noise, basically. Okay, It's a very, I don't know, measurement device, very sensitive to noise, and you're trying to limit that. Therefore, you have to go after EMI, uh, uh, ZVS, and ZCS, or in general, soft switching techniques. OK, any questions so far? So we pretty much had this introduction to kind of justify why we are doing that. So what we are going to do next week is basically go after a few most common approaches of soft switching you know, techniques. If you were coming late, I explained the homework assignment, what exactly I expect from you guys to do. And that is just close this loop. Uh, measure the output voltage, find the compensation network, have a PWM block over here, and then feed it back instead of this, this source over there. So we are tr basically trying to f uh, con cl close the loop and regulate the output voltage. I believe it was like 240 volts or something like that. Question? Yes, just the voltage mode control. So the advantage over here is we don't have to worry about the current it is automatically being adjusted, basically. Yes, just the voltage mode control. Other questions? All right, then I'll see you guys on uh, next week on Tuesday.
Thank you.